Hey guys, it's Zach. So with a 30% tax credit set to expire at the end of this year, things in the solar industry are pretty crazy right now. Homeowners are all rushing to make this deadline while installers and manufacturers, they're all getting pushed to their limits. And one of the most popular questions that I get asked is, which solar panel is the best? And honestly, with how many good panels there are today, that answer can really vary. And I get it, trying to compare these different panels from different installer proposals can be extremely confusing, especially if this is your very first time looking at solar. So let's cover four key things that you should know when picking the right solar panel for your home, including expected cost differences. Number one is availability. And for all my sports fans out there, there's a famous quote that I'm sure you've heard once before, a player's best ability is their availability. And the same goes for solar panels right now within the current market. With this surge in demand, specific panel availability has become inconsistent and honestly, unpredictable. We've seen some key manufacturers in the space struggle to keep up, which has forced installers to pivot to other options. So the most important attribute of any panel that you're looking to install is it actually being available by suppliers. All of these fun little metrics on different panels that we like to discuss are completely useless if it means you get installed in 2026 and miss out on that 30% tax credit. And we're gonna cover this more, but the fortunate thing here to remember is there are a lot of different panels from different manufacturers that have very, very similar specs. So while you might not get the solar panel of your dreams, you can likely get one that's extremely close and realistically, it's gonna offer you a very similar performance. Just to give you context, I've rotated through probably six different manufacturers in the last eight weeks simply due to panel availability constantly changing. So be prepared to be flexible in case a curveball is thrown your way. Number two, panel specs. Now, if you've ever looked at a solar panel data sheet, it's kind of like trying to read a foreign language if you're not sure what you're looking for. You've got watts, amps, volts, acronyms, different cell technology, and all of these numbers everywhere. What actually matters? I'm gonna give you two different answers depending on how technical you like to get. Here's the simple answer. The easier thing to focus your effort on, which hopefully makes going solar less stressful, is to first find the right solar installer for your project. Because if you pick the right installer and there's someone you trust, they're knowledgeable, and they have a good track record in your area, they will be carrying a range of highly rated panels. I'd ask them for a proposal with their recommended premium option, their recommended standard option, and compare the two. Maybe even get feedback on which panel they prefer and why. Plus, their proposal software will be able to pull all of those confusing metrics from that specific panel's data sheet, take the information on your home and your roof, and then accurately forecast the system's monthly and annual energy generation, savings, and costs. This breaks it down to things that actually matter in a more relatable way. With all that being said, if you are more technical, here are a couple of performance metrics worth discussing. Panel wattage is probably the first technical metric that you're gonna notice. This might be 400 watts, 430 watts, 460 watts, or somewhere in between. This number represents that panel's max power output under perfect conditions, also known as the STC rating, standard test conditions. And remember this, more watts does not always mean a better panel. So the metric you wanna cross-reference wattage with is module efficiency. This efficiency metric on a panel data sheet is pretty easy to find and it measures how much sunlight hitting the panel is actually converted into electrical power. And most panels will fall between 20 and 23% for their efficiency. And then anything closer to 22 or 23% or higher even is considered premium. And then pairing this efficiency back to wattage, two panels, they can have the same wattage let's say 430 watts, but they can have different physical footprints and then different efficiencies. A panel with a higher efficiency generally has a more compact footprint, while panels with a bit lower efficiency, they usually reach their wattage rating through just being a physically larger panel. If you're tight on quality roof exposure, going with a premium, more compact panel could really pay off since you wanna maximize each square foot of roof space. Oh, and if you are curious whether solar and a battery system would actually make sense for your home, book a zero pressure discovery call with me. It's completely free, it takes just 15 minutes. That link can be found in the description below. If you're in my service area, I'd be happy to assist. If you're not, I will let you know ahead of time and send you any resources specific to you that could be helpful for your research. Another metric that gets brought up a bunch is temperature coefficient, which being in Arizona personally, it is an important one to discuss. So with solar panels, just like any piece of technology, when it gets really hot, you can expect there to be some performance losses. 
prices. A lot of panels offered today will feature a temp coefficient within the range of minus 0.24% and minus 0.35%, with a lot of panels sitting right in the middle of this range. Since it's a negative metric, the lower the number, the better. Any panel within this range, I would consider to perform well in super hot conditions, some just better than others. So let's use minus 0.30% for example. This temp coefficient number represents how much power output a panel will lose for every degree Celsius above the standard 25 degree Celsius test condition. And I know we have a mostly American audience here, so I did include some conversions to Fahrenheit here on the screen. And for even easier numbers, let's go ahead and move the decimal over in this example and make it minus 3% for every 10 degrees above that 25 degrees Celsius mark. If it's a summer day here in the US, your panel surface can definitely reach 75 degrees Celsius and this 75 degrees would be 50 degrees above the standard test rating. Here would be the total percent losses on this example 75 degree summer day between an industry standard base level panel, a premium option, and then the best of the best. And as you can see, the total losses related to high temps aren't anything overly significant, but they can certainly add up over time. However, these panels with super low temp coefficients are also more expensive. You are paying for these performance bumps. So the good news of all of this, this type of analysis isn't your job to figure out. All the solar design software used today will be able to calculate how all of these specs translate into system performance throughout the year. But ultimately, if you do live in a hotter climate, Going with a panel that offers a better temp coefficient can definitely be a value to you, but the difference between the top of the line to mid range isn't quite as astronomical as it might seem. Number three, warranties. Do they actually matter? To me, warranties are a little overrated with solar panels because all panels offered today by installers have really long warranties. Almost all of them are ranging from 25 to 30 years. This has become the new standard of today's panels and for good reason because solar panels, they're almost never a point of failure within the system. They're notoriously very reliable. These offered warranties will include a product warranty and then some sort of performance warranty. We're not going to talk about labor warranties since very few panel manufacturers actually offer this. And labor coverage is typically coming from an installer's warranty directly anyway. So for the product warranty, this would cover manufacturer defects, which can include frame damage, glass damage, connection issues, or defective cells. Anything that physically fails at the fault of the manufacturer. The other warranty is the performance warranty, and this one is more important to understand because it can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, although most of them are very similar in today's market. The performance warranty is directly related to the panel's degradation rate, and this number represents the maximum amount of annual degradation. Base level panels will typically have a degradation rate of half percent per year, while a premium option would be closer to a quarter percent for its annual degradation rate. And like I mentioned, panel failure is very rare. In the 10 years of doing this, I could probably count on one hand the amount of times that I've seen a solar panel fail post-installation. Additionally, these fractions of percentages that we're talking about here would be the max degradation rate per year, not the expected amount of degradation. And I really see these warranties and all of these degradation rates more so as a representation of confidence from a manufacturer and that technology that they're offering. Regardless, if you plan on being in the home for the long haul, then going with a panel that has a better warranty stack should ultimately create more value for you since a lower degradation rate means more energy generated. But just like with all of these tech specs and warranties, the better the numbers, the better the performance, the higher the price point. But if you just like that better warranty and the better tech, then go with a premium option. Oh, and if you are getting any value from today's video, drop me a quick thumbs up. I really do appreciate it. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And number four, let's talk money. How much more should you expect to pay for a higher end premium panel when compared to a standard base level panel? Now for most homeowners, system costs, it's gonna be a huge part of the overall decision. And the cost differences between panel options might not always be easy to spot between different proposals, especially when comparing these proposals from different installers. The typical expected increase from a standard base panel to a premium panel would likely be somewhere between 10 cents a watt and 30 cents per watt. So for reference on a 10 kilowatt system, which is 10,000 watts, that 10 cents to 30 cents more per watt would equate to $1,000 to $3,000 more in total. Keep in mind, this could easily change between now and the end of the year if manufacturers apply any price increases due to this increase in demand. So is going premium worth it? Do you really need the best? Well, 
It's all based on your situation. If you have more limited roof space, you live in a hotter climate, or you just like to buy the statistically best option in most cases, having a higher efficiency panel with better warranties could be worth the cost increase if it's still within your budget and it's available. But if after listening to this video, you feel like all of these comparisons are just splitting hairs, then I wouldn't overthink it. And I just opt for whatever quality panel your installer is recommending, assuming they have a good track record and the price makes sense. Ultimately, there are a lot of good panels out there today that have extremely similar metrics and warranties just from different manufacturers. Now, before signing that final contract to go solar, check out this video here on the screen to see why solar panels alone might not be enough for what you need. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you all next time.